Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News and welcome to this special presentation, The Ultimate Guide to Uranium Investing. I'm going to walk you through the history of this fascinating element as well as present my investing thesis using that mix of fundamental and technical analysis as well as human psychology and sentiment towards the space. So for a lot of people, uranium conjures up these images of this toxic green substance that only exists in nuclear reactors and labs, but that's not actually the case. So uranium is the heaviest naturally occurring element in the universe, 40 times more abundant than silver on Earth, and we have these reactions taking place all around us in nature. Uranium is responsible for the majority of the heat given off in the mantle just under the Earth's crust. Now, uranium was first discovered in 1789, but it wasn't until 1896 that Henry Becquerel and Marie Curie realized the significance and coined this term radioactivity after they'd conducted these experiments sitting uranium on photographic slides in the sun, thinking it was absorbing energy from the sun. One day, there's an overcast day, so they sit it in a drawer. They still decide to develop the film, and they realize that it is giving off something that they're not familiar with. Now, at the time, this and other radioactive elements were thought to be a miracle cure from everything from cancer and people were bathing in these substances, making glass and drinking out of them. And obviously, later on, we realized the danger of these elements. The danger comes from these different isotopes. And if you're like me and you love organic chemistry, you're familiar with how different elements can have different numbers of neutrons in their core and give off energy and we're going to talk about why this reaction is so significant going forward but uranium exists greater than 99 percent in this form in nature but it's uranium 235 that we want for these reactions but that's less than one percent of that occurring isotope in nature so we're going to be talking about nuclear fission today which is different to nuclear fusion where we have um, the combination of elements to release energy in fission we're talking about um, breaking down to give off barium and krypton in uranium's case, as well as releasing those neutrons and large amounts of energy. So there is studies underway to try and harness nuclear fusion going forward, but it's nuclear fission that we are talking about when describing reactors. Now this fission reaction takes place, you're all familiar with E equals MC squared, that famous equation, and we can get quite a large amount of energy from just a tiny piece of mass. And we know that uranium, a tiny little pellet the size of your finger, has as much energy in it as you know 120 gallons of oil, a ton of coal, 1,700 cubic feet of natural gas. And there is just an abundance uh, out there. You know, People say it's practically an infinite fuel source if we decide to go down this path. Now, we know that the that energy was also harnessed for nefarious purposes when Nagasaki and Hiroshima were bombed back in World War II. So something to be aware of, and this did actually affect Japan, who's now um, becoming more pro-nuclear. We're going to discuss that as well. So here's the nuclear fuel life cycle, where we go from mining through this enrichment process that we'll discuss um, for electricity generation, and then we can actually recycle this, but we do need to dispose of this correctly as well. Now, a lot of people have this image of yellow cake, and they might have read about nuclear reactors and fuel a little bit, but that's only the first step in the process after we mine uranium ore. So we have to turn it into uranium oxide and then uh, uranium fluoride in this enrichment process. And this is fascinating if you're like me and you love chemistry before we create these rods that can be used in the nuclear reactors. So centrifuges play a large part in this process. And if you don't know what a centrifuge is, it is a device that spins really quickly. Think of that uh, ride at the show where you get pushed to the edge because of gravity, because of how heavy you are when um, the machine starts spinning. So in a similar vein, that 238 element is a lot, well, not a lot heavier, but relatively heavier than 235. So it is pushed to the edge of these cylinders when they're spinning and the 235, the lighter element, is extracted in the middle of these centrifuges um, from that lower than 1% to get the grade up so we can use and make these uh, rods as pellets. 
Now this reaction, once we have the 235, takes place as we've described, breaking down into krypton and baryon and releasing neutrons, which then hit other uranium atoms. And again, this sparks this chain reaction and huge amount of energy released as heat. Now we know that this process can be done safely, but if it goes wrong, it can be disastrous. And Chernobyl happened back in 1986. If you've seen these images, it's like it's um, time has stood still there. And it's gonna take thousands of years for that, radio, uh, that radiation levels to drop to where it's safe enough for humans to live again. Now more recently, we had the Fukushima disaster. And this is where the sentiment towards uranium really you know, got terrible. So this was back in 2011, we had an earthquake um, followed by a tsunami, and this was really just a disaster. You might have seen this in the news, it continues to be an issue to this day. Um, and six years after Fukushima, Japan has lost faith in nuclear energy, as this article says, in 2017. So at the time, they actually shut down all 50 of their nuclear reactors, and a lot of other countries started to really consider, hey, do we want, want to have this as a source of energy as well? And here you can see um, that effect where it does get into the ocean and leak across the globe as well. So definitely something we need to be aware of. Now recently, the spot price of uranium has declined 90% from you know $130 a pound to around $20 or even less. So as we see, sentiment bad, people saying we're not gonna use this in the future and the price of not only um, the ore itself, but a lot of the stocks, and we see the URI ETF here going from over $130 down to $12 more recently. So stocks are hit hard when the price of any commodity falls. Now, a lot of these larger mines have shut their doors indefinitely. And here we see the number of mines going offline. These are some of the biggest uranium mines in the world shutting down. And this is just added to that completely negative sentiment. Um, and you've probably read about this in the news as well. So uranium over the last three years, as we said, it's been one of the worst performing commodities, but recently there's been a bit of a change in that sentiment. This was an interesting article that you should check out about how these disasters actually show us that it is quite safe when we compared it to other energy sources and how bigger disasters they have had. So check this out. The number of relative um, deaths and harm to the environment is actually not that significant. But again, this is something that's still being hotly debated. So since last year, uranium has actually made a bit of a comeback, being one of the best performing commodities, and we want to examine why that is. Now, Japan have recently restarted 10 reactors, and if you want to pause here, guys, this is just showing the number of reactors that are either under review or coming back online, and that sentiment has changed. They believe that they can do this safely, and this is a country that has been strongly negative affected, neg negatively affected um, by nuclear uh, reactions. So it's it's so interesting to me that Japan of all countries are taking this positive stance towards nuclear energy. Now here we see a list of countries and the share of electricity that they get from nuclear energy. And a lot of people aren't aware that this is a really high number in a number of countries. And if we actually have a look at the number of reactors in a lot of countries, I think very few people would know that the United States has nearly 100 nuclear reactors and gets 20% of its electricity from nuclear power. Now, if we have a look at the global stats, 10% of electricity globally is generated from nuclear power. Here we see the United States being a huge consumer of energy uh, at the top of the list there, even though only 20% per se comes from nuclear. So the uranium production in the US has been on the decline. Back in the 70s and 80s, the US exported 90% of their uranium to the rest of the world. They had way too much. Now that has dramatically declined and they're in a position where they import up to 99% of all their uranium ore from other countries. And if we have a look at which of those countries are making this uranium ore, we see Kazakhstan at the top of the list and then those resource rich countries, Canada, Australia, and so on. Now, the lot of these countries, nearly 50% are former Soviet countries that the US doesn't 
and they're not really on too friendly terms with. So this is an incredible situation where a country is so responsible on countries that it doesn't really get on that well with for something that is a huge part of their energy grid and everyday life. And this creates an interesting dynamic. And this is one of the things that Marin Katusa speaks about in his book, The Cold of War. I absolutely love this book. It's on there in the shelf behind me. I strongly recommend you guys read this if you want to learn more about how energy really controls the world and affects geopolitics. Now, recently, this led to a decision, Section 232. In the next 90 days, Donald Trump is going to make a decision about protecting local jobs and uranium producers. And this is very similar to the decision they made around steel and aluminium and chose to slap tariffs on importing from other countries. So this can really change the dynamic. And at the end, I'm going to talk about what stocks this is going to affect and what I'm looking to invest in either way once this outcome um, becomes public. So here we see the nuclear power reactors and the requirements worldwide. So the tons on the end here, but what's really interesting is these total numbers down the bottom. And here we see something crazy like 400 operatable um, nuclear reactors at present, but when we see the number under construction, you know, 50, another 120 planned, another 380 proposed. So there's so many nuclear reactors that are coming online. This space isn't dying like a lot of people think it is. It's actually really about to grow. And when we see the deficit gap between supply and demand, this is the basics of investing, guys. Different estimates are around um, you know, 40 to 50 or greater million pound deficit as we go forward here. There is not going to be enough supply to keep up with the demand if these projections are correct. Now, that has led to specific funds such as Yellowcate decide that, hey, we're just going to hoard uranium oxide, basically create an investment product because we believe this is so undervalued. And they bought 8 million pounds of uranium oxide for $200 million just because they think this is such a good investment. Now, I've shown this life cycle before, and this is the same for all commodities. And we are definitely in this section here where we've had companies shutting down declining exploration. We've seen mergers and capitulation in the price and we're starting to get to this, you know, the cash takeovers and this sort of thing. So I definitely think that we're in the right part of this cycle, but I want to talk about um, the bearish case just quickly, playing devil's advocate. And what the bears are saying that, look, there's so many reactors that are due to shut down and go offline, hit their um, expiration date where they, the mines are, and reactors are retired. And the counter argument to this is that it's very easy to extend that um, reactor life 20 or even 40 years. Now, the cost of a new new reactor is somewhere around $20 billion, and there's years of paperwork to get through depending on what country you're in. Um, it's not easy to reactivate these old mines, and there's, you know, it's really expensive to get the right staff and so on. So I think it's more favorable and practical for people to extend these mines. So I don't think that these numbers are going to be correct where we're seeing you know, dozens of reactors being shut down in the coming years if that energy demand is still there. The other counter argument is that the total amount of renewables from other sources, you know, wind, solar, and so on, is going to continue to increase. And I certainly agree with that, but I think that's going to be more of a turn away, um, you know, from coal and, and, and oil. I certainly think that nuclear can work hand in hand with these other renewable energy sources. So that brings me to sentiment and psychology. And I wanted to show you the searches for uranium investing versus cannabis investing. Now, cannabis investing was non-existent 10 years ago. And here we've seen everyone getting really excited about the cannabis space, medical marijuana, and how to invest in it. We compare that to uranium, where the price peaked back in December 2006. Huge number of searches. How do I invest? And now that number is literally near zero. There's no one interested in this space. And that's how I know that sentiment is bad. So finally, just wrapping up, I want to talk about the best stocks, ETFs, ways to play this space. And I'm going to do a follow-up video for our premium members, letting you know exactly what I'm looking at and how I plan on getting the best exposure to the uranium sector. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, guys. Smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share these videos around, and thanks for tuning in, guys. Cheers.